Um, so I have Phil Helm Baker here with us today. Um, I've known Phil for, I think, I believe over 10 years. We first met in the early days of the web in 93, 94, when I believe Phil was still at CERN among the, with all the other early web folks. And um, Phil works now on security at uh, VeriSign. And um, we met at the W3C AC meeting in, the, in December. And um, he suggested that you know perhaps companies like us could get together and sort of figure out ways of coming coming up with schemes where we spot both phishing mail and spam mail and come up with concerted attacks that beat these things. Um, Phil had some very good ideas, and security isn't exactly my primary field of work. So I said the best way to you know, make get some of those ideas percolated through Google was to have him come and give a talk here. So um, thanks for coming, Phil, and take it away. Thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about internet crime. More importantly, what can we do to stop it or minimize it? Brief introduction to VeriSign. Not because I'm here to plug the company, but because to know what I'm talking about, you need to know where I stand. VeriSign has a very simple business model. We paint a bullseye on ourselves. We do the types of things that, when you suggest doing them in a room, there's somebody who says, oh, I don't want to do that. Legal, hacking, security, risk, uptime. We do the stuff that is infrastructure that just has to be there has to be reliable, has to be dependable. We operate the DNS, the core DNS. We have uh, 32 million names under management, 12 billion queries a day. The peak load is much higher. There aren't many people who do 12 billion transactions a day. We do tr digital certificates, 400,000 websites. We're also into telecommunications. This is something that you probably aren't aware of because we have a big internet presence. We do telephone switching. Crazy Frog, our uh, ringtone character, had a top 40. He was top um, number one in the UK charts for four weeks running this last year. What we really do, though, we make ourselves a target so that other people don't have to. Our DNS services are under constant denial of service attack. Something like 1,000, 2,000 attacks every day that are worth measuring. Managed security services, we have 3,500 devices under management. Those are all under attack. Digital certificates, a phishing target. Telecommunications, a fraud target. So. I'm not really here to sell you a security product. What I'm here for is to ask you to help make my life a bit easier by let's work to do, see what we can do to gang up on the criminals and make the infrastructure more resistant to these attacks so that we don't have to have so many rooms full of computers fending off the attackers. So internet crime. How did we get there? Note that I've uh, changed my PowerPoint style to uh, fit in with Google. I thought that this would uh, go down well. We can't afford them. <laughs> so um, how do we get here? Well, hacking and internet crime started really slowly. In fact, the original hackers people didn't really take them seriously because they weren't really seriously trying to take down the internet. Uh, even the Morris Worm, which was the most notorious hacker case of the 80s. You know, the guy, you know, he wasn't really trying to take down the internet. He was, you know, trying to do something that was going to be cool and he accidentally brought down the internet. In the 1990s, things got worse. Um, it was no longer a small number of intelligent hackers who were out to do clever things. 
it was now a large number of hackers who were out to do mean things. If you've read any uh, of the uh, intercepted com communications from this guy, you'll know that he really was out to do mean things. I used to be at Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, we had to reinstall VMS on every single machine in the entire company because Kevin Mitnick here got into the uh, corporate network. That cost us several million dollars. So 1990s, internet crime was starting to become serious. It was a serious problem, but still, you know, the face of internet crime were these lovely, cuddly uh, script kiddies that uh, you know, folk at the EFF uh, just loved to death and uh, wanted to get out of jail. And suggesting that sending these guys to jail for five, ten years was unpopular. Today, internet crime, it's not about the hackers, it's not about the script kiddies. It's about dollars. Or rubles, or cents, or yen. It's about money. And that's the big change that we see in internet crime. One of the things that's happened, all those teenage script kiddie vandals of the 1990s, the vast majority, they grow up, they get some sense, they get a job, and they stop. One or two, they can't get a job. They don't want to keep on living with the parents, and it's not just for kicks, it's now for making money. This is now their profession. And this is exactly the same thing that you see in traditional crime. Most crime is committed by teenage males. And then when they get to 18, 20, 21, 25, they get jobs and they have to make a decision. I'm going to keep on with the petty crime or am I going to go pro? Most people go straight. Some people make crime their profession. And that's what we're now seeing on the internet. And the worst crimes are now directly caused by that handful of people who've gone pro. So what are the crimes? Well, there's phishing. I would guess that everybody here gets uh, several of these a day. I get about, um, about 1,000 spams a day. And about a third of them are now phishing. Important crime, I'll come back to that one. It's also extortion. In the old days, the objective of a denial of service attack was just take the guy's site down. You know, cause some mayhem, cause some misery. Today, what they're after is money. And so what you see is a denial of service attack against uh, typically an online gambling site, but pretty much any site can be attacked. Uh, anybody here know of the uh, million dollar homepage? That guy has uh, been receiving uh, blackmail attacks from hackers. $50,000 or you won't see your website again. And uh, here we have the Cray twins who uh, were two London gangsters who did the same thing uh, in real space. Uh, they would go up to a, a business and say, nice business you got here, it'd be a shame if it uh, got broke. And if you didn't pay them, they'd break it. And this is one of the things you see about internet crime. It's all old crimes. There's nothing new in the crimes. The only thing that's really new here is the medium. And what did we expect? Internet. Everything's going online. All the commerce is going online. Well, all the money's now online. And so now the attacks are following the money. It's like, uh, why do you rob banks? That's where the money is. Why do you hack the internet? That's where the money is. And then you have advanced fee frauds. Um, this guy is uh, a criminal from Nigeria who does advanced fee frauds. I got this from 41980.com, uh, which is a site for, which is run by people who make a sport out of baiting 
the 419 scanners. So when they get one of these Nigerian letters, they reply and uh, ask them to prove their good faith by doing silly things. And if you go to that, that site, it's a great resource because this, this isn't just one scammer. It's not just 10 scammers. It's not just 100 scammers that they have got that way. It is page after page after page after page. They must have pictures of something like 500 different individuals on that site. And those are just the uh, scammers who they managed to trick to do one of these things. For each one that they trick, there must be 10 more that they didn't trick. How do you know that's the scammer? Did you scam somebody else into getting their picture taken holding this sign? Quite probably, but I'm pretty sure that no scammer will be caught more than once or twice or three times with this thing. But another thing that's really interesting, when you go to the site, the backdrops are the same quite often. And so one of the things that that's telling us is that this is now a franchise. People aren't making money from the actual 419 scam itself. What they're doing is selling the ability to other people to do this 419 scam. So you have a little franchise industry in Nigeria, and that's the reason why it's so concentrated in that locality. The actual advance fee fraud gangs have new frauds. Um, same basic principle, give us some money and we'll give you a commission. Same principle, uh, but a different setting. For example, if you put a BMW, an expensive car or, or motorbike on eBay, you're likely to get somebody from West Africa saying, hey, I'll buy your bike from you. Here's $50,000 and hit, hit but I'll pay you $55,000, you pay $5,000 to the shipper and we'll get a cashier's check. And then the cashier's check will bounce. But after you've paid the money on thinking that cashier's checks are guaranteed payment, they're only guaranteed against credit risk, they're not guaranteed against fraud. So, and you know, I could go on for the rest of the talk, talking about the scams, I could go off them for the rest of the day. I've written a book about them. It's about 100,000 words, the manuscript at the moment. It's bad. It's ugly. But what I really want you to take home from this is that this stuff is serious. And these people, I mean, okay, here we're making a joke out of them. But they really are taking people's life savings. And the heartbreaking part of the job that I'm doing is when you find out about... 70-year-old, 80-year-old grandmothers who've been tricked by these groups and send, they've sent them $30,000, $40,000 that they're going to need to eat off. So it's serious, it's real, we've got to get a handle on it. First, let's look at some of the tools that they're using because if we're going to defeat the bad guys, we've got to, take a, we've got to look at the tools and neutralize them. First tool is spam. When it started, spam was being treated like, but as an annoyance. It was something, oh, spam, you know, just get over it. You get spam. And then the volume started to get to the point where email was becoming unusable. And people said, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, you got to do, do something about it. I got spam bays. I'm OK. I'm not getting any spam. Oh, you're getting spam? Well, that's your, your hard luck. I, I don't get any. Stopping spam is about stopping crime. Spam is the number one vector for internet crime. Every one of these crimes that I'm talking about has spam at some point in their life cycle. The other common feature that we have is botnets. In the old days, the spammers used to actually buy machines and send out, and buy internet connectivity and send out the spam over their internet connectivity. There are a small number of quasi-honest spammers still doing that. Um, you know, these are the people who are selling you the CR list and so on. So you know, they're still, still do doing illegal stuff. You know, they're still selling you drugs illegally. But you, know, you pay your money and you do actually get the goods. 
something like 60, 70, depending upon how, who you ask, 70% of the spam is coming from botnets, which are machines that have been compromised, turned into a zombie. And here we have a picture of a zombie. So the home computers connected to broadband that's been compromised and are now being controlled by the criminals. So this is an even better trick than the old gangsters used to have when they used to steal getaway cars. The criminals use these botnets to hide themselves. They're using the stolen computer instead of the stolen getaway car. But these criminals have found a way of using the stolen getaway car and the user is still paying for the gas. The owner is still paying for the internet connectivity and the electricity. The botnets, there are various estimates about how large they are. Most botnets that we can trace get into the thousands. Above that, actually synchronizing them starts to seem to become a problem for the uh, herders. But there are certainly herders who have something like 50,000 machines at their disposal. There are a lot, few very large botnets out there. Most of them are smaller. And of course, I talked about spam. Well, spam begets botnets begets spam. They use the botnet to send out spam. When they start to find that they're getting low on machines for their botnets, they send out some spam that has Trojans. Or if they don't have the executable in the spam itself, they'll have spam that takes you to a site that will do a drive-by download of some Trojan onto your machine. And that machine has then been captured into the botnet. So spam and botnets, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. You know, think of it as the life cycle of an insect. You know, <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. Um, when it comes to computer security, there are, everybody lives in a glass house. I can show you compromises of every major application being used on the internet, every major platform, and every major server application. And it only takes one to break them. The hackers are looking for the most dollars. So they have in the past been concentrating on the most widespread platforms. However, as soon as Firefox got up to the point where it was uh, reporting 10% penetration, we started to see attacks against Firefox. So don't mistake not being vulnerable for not being a target. And one of the things that happens here is that security is very much like the problem of the car alarm. You have a car, first generation car alarms, most of them were not very good. Because as soon as you put the alarm on the car, the thieves are going to steal another car. In the days when only one car in 20 had a car alarm, it had to be a really special car before it was worth working out how to undo the car alarm. Now every car comes with a car alarm from the factory. There's a difference. Have you got a good car alarm or have you got a bad car alarm? At the moment, we're all living in glass houses. And this is actually a very important message that we've got to get home to certain communities who are saying, hey, we're secure. We're using Unix. I'm absolutely aware of that. I run my own honeybutton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I used to, and as mentioned before, I used to work for DEC. And I remember when uh, Unix started to first appear and started to first displace VMS. And uh, we used to make some comments about security in those days as well. And, uh, you know, didn't really make an effect. Another tool that the criminals have is criminal exchanges. This is a site called cardaportal.com. Um, it's Russian. Uh, the the uh, so, the writing there is in Cyrillic. Uh, this actually was traced down to Russia. Um, you know, the motto here, Carders of all lands unite. And they have a picture of Lenin on their home page. Um, doesn't appear that they uh, spent much of their time in uh, class because that's actually Marx, not Lenin. 
but uh, we'll give them that. Uh, the hackers use the internet as a collaboration tool. They use it to exchange stolen goods. Uh, Card portal was used to uh, exchange stolen credit card numbers. So you have the guy who's doing the phishing and stealing the credit card numbers. Now he can sell those to another criminal who's in the business of carding, making use of those numbers. So these card portals have been very important in, in the business of internet crime. And working out how to disrupt these networks is very important in terms of how we deal with internet crime. So, let's take a, uh, a phrase from uh, the uh, opposition's favorite philosopher, well, p politician, what is to be done? It's not just about measuring the world and, you know, when you go to the conferences, you, know, you can sort of like give a figure like 60% of the spam is coming from botnets and somebody will say, hey, are you sure? We're measuring the figure and it's 65. Or, no, it's 62.4. And, well, yeah. We can spend all day measuring the problem and getting really accurate assessments of how bad the problem is, or we can do something about fixing it. So what's to be done? Well, one, one good one is let's blame the users, or user education as it's called. Um, when, I, when the phishing thing first started, it was very much like the spam thing, and people are saying, hey, the problem is that people give away their credit card numbers on the internet. Just tell them not to do it. Well, OK, you try and tell 60-year-old grandmothers that the message that came from their bank with their bank logo looks exactly like the messages from their banks that takes them to a site that looks exactly like the messages on their site with some JavaScript that pops a little GIF image up covering up the address bar so the address looks like it's a bank. You tell them to not do something silly. I mean, these confidence tricks only need to work a small percentage of the time to work. So user education does play a part. Explain the scams to people, and people can protect themselves. But we need to do more than just blame the user if we're going to get a handle on internet crime. Blaming the user can't be an acceptable solution. Another option, the law. One of the myths of internet crime is that uh, law enforcement doesn't work. Well, no, law enforcement does work. And if you go to the uh, Secret Service website or the Department of Justice website, they have a running tally of the cybercrime cases that have been investigated and the results that they've got. This is uh, Shadow Crew's website. Shadow Crew was another large Card, card, criminal exchange, like uh, Carda Portal. And Shadow Crew was taken down about uh, 15 months ago now. And uh, the Department of Justice has received plea bargains from 15 of the individuals involved, sentencing to take place uh, next month and March. The uh, Shadow Crew site was estimated to have been involved with frauds of approximately $4 million worth. And there were several thousand individuals who were associated with that site. So they've got the kingpins, and now they're in the business of rolling up the rest of the organization and uh, making a decision as to which cases to prosecute. It was also an international case. Arrests have 15 arrests in the US, another 18 around the world. Law enforcement from 13 different countries involved. So the law can be effective. The problem is the law is also very, very expensive. Cases like Shadow Crew cost millions to investigate. It costs more to investigate one of these crimes than the proceeds of the crime. Two things that can be done with the law, trigger penalties. When the FBI are investigating their cases, when they're setting their priorities, they look at the number of years in prison that will result at sentencing. So if a case is going to be 
a five-year prison case, that will get a lower priority than a crime that's a 30-year. Another thing that happened is tripwire offences. Um, in the UK, there's a, a very old law against carrying housebreaking tools after dark. OK. It's cri we all know that it's criminal to break into a house. But most of the time, when the police catch up with the person, they're not actually breaking into the house. They're either on their way to the, th the house or on their way back. So by creating this crime of preparing for crime, you have a tripwire offence. And one of the tripwire offences that was used very extensively in the Shadow Crew case is there's a criminal offence in the US having the, the equipment to create fraudulent credit cards. And most of the people who were involved in credit Shadow Crew had that equipment in their house. Oh, so the FBI say, great, we've got you instant five-year penalty just for having that equipment. OK, now we'll go into the plea agreement. So tri tri trigger penalties and tripwire offences are important. And the law is important because if you have a small amount of law enforcement, a small amount of deterrence, that will greatly magnify the effect of all your other offences. If you make it criminal to supply information about security vulnerabilities to somebody with a reasonable expectation that that's going to be used for criminal ends, that is a big deterrent to a lot of the specialists who make their living by providing that information. So the law is important, but if we're really going to get a handle on this, we've got to change the internet. We've got to make the internet resistant to crime. We've got to make the internet infrastructure crime resistant. OK, well, wasn't that the um, plan all along? I mean, for the past 15 years, every survey that has come up has said that security is the number one priority for virtually every you, group of users you can imagine. Enterprise CIOs say, oh, security is our top number one thing. Users say, oh, I'm very worried about internet security. It's a constant refrain. But actually, no, people are concerned about security. But what they really want to do is to get their job done. And the security that's been provided has been of the wrong sort. It's been of the sort of, here is a bulletproof vest that you can wear 24 hours a day, just in case somebody might take a pot shot up at you. And that's the good stuff. The worst stuff is, here's the armored car that you can sit in all day, or here's the bunker that you can retreat to. People, number one priority is always getting their work done. And if you put barriers in between the person and their work that are there for security, they will find ways to evade them. And we see that in every company. You put barriers in front of people, they will work out a way round. So, OK, we're black to blaming the users. But yes, that's not very productive. One of the problems that we had is that the perspective on internet security is very, very much the same perspective that we've had on information security. Information security, it all came out of the military. They had secrets that they wanted to keep. They had information that they wanted to move around the battlefield so that the person receiving it could be sure this came from our control, not the other guys. Actually, that's the number one use of battlefield um, Cryptography. It's not about keeping secrets from the enemy. By the time they've broken the code, the missile will already have landed. The gun will already have fired. What they're really interested in is integrity. Uh, during the Second World War and the First World War, uh, there were a couple of cases where communication systems were broken and uh, people were sending messages as, of the sort, OK, aim the guns here. 
you get the idea. So, permission-based security, it's all about building walls. It's all about, here's my castle, and I'm going to defend it. Here's my assets. I'm going to keep control of my assets. I'm going to protect the confidentiality of my information. I'm going to protect the integrity. It's all about building walls. The problem is that works great inside organizations. But when you get to the internet, you've got to go beyond the walls. I live in a my, I come from a city called Chester. Chester's unusual because it's the only city in uh, Europe that has the complete cycle of medieval walls. If you were inside the walls, you were safe. If you were outside the walls, well, <laughs> you're on your own. Now we're in the internet age, everybody's spending an increasing amount of time outside the walls. We need to make it safe outside the walls as well. So how do you do that? Well, you've got to change the paradigm. The way that, you made, that England was made safe beyond the walls was by introducing police, introducing people who would investigate crimes and create a reasonable expectation that if you did crime, you would do the time. If we abstract that principle, it's all about accountability. If you do something bad on the internet, you have to be held accountable. If you want to do something that requires a privilege, a permission, a use of resources from somebody else, you're going to have to establish your bona fides and prove, or at least establish, to the other person's reasonable expectations. You're not going to abuse that trust. So accountability is a three-phase, three-pronged approach. Authentication, know who you're talking to. Accreditation, know something about them. It doesn't need to be very much. If you look at Slashdot, Slashdot is just the same as any other blog. It just happens to have, what is it, quarter of a million registered users these days? Slashdot's comment system isn't very much different from the rest of the blogs. The difference is that you've got a reputation that follows you around. And if you start doing silly things like putting graffiti onto other people's comments, your reputation suffers. You suffer consequences. So that's the third tier. Authentication, accreditation, and consequences. And that's the way that you put security systems together to work in the internet as opposed to within the castle. Within the castle, permission-based security is king. Outside the castle, you need to have accountability because you're not going to know all the bad things that could happen to you in advance. And you certainly aren't going to be able to create a list of them and type them into a computer in a form that the computer can understand. The way that you keep social systems stable is accountability. OK. How can we add that to the internet? One other thing, we have to make it usable. Uh, earlier, I had a little rant about blame the user. You also have to don't confuse the user either. If you look at the typical security user interface, they require just far too much effort from the user. I, how many people here has a, have a Wi-Fi uh, box at home? How many people have encryption turned on? How many people spent more than an hour getting their encryption system to work right and reliably? Yes. I especially like the bit on Windows XP when you're typing in a code that's an, essentially an authentication code, and you're having to type it into this box. It's a 128-bit key. You're typing it in a hexadecimal into a box that doesn't show you what the key is. And then you have to confirm it. <laughs> it's an authentication. Can't the access code point tell you? I, I'm, I'm not going to go there because my blood pressure. 
Okay, how are we going to get a handle on phishing? Phishing is due to two failures in the world around us, two security set failures. One is insecure credentials. You can't steal a password if the password changes every time you use it. Unfortunately, the passwords that's been stolen most often, credit card numbers. The early, credit card, the early phishing fraud actually was because of an even worse problem that's now being fixed, so I'll mention it to you. And that was, if you had this credit card number and you had a bit of computing power and a bit of ingenuity, you could work out what the ATM pin was. Yeah. The uh, credit card, the uh, ATM systems interface security was designed in the 1960s and was not particularly good. So there's credential theft. We can introduce the trust. Sorry, we can introduce trusted credentials. I get to that. But the other thing is the impersonation of a trusted party, impersonating the bank. So phishing is about the credential theft. It's about impersonation. So let's go through those in turn. One solution is theft-proof credentials. This is an oath token, and this is my authenticator for inside VeriSign. It's a PKI token. So I can plug this into the laptop, and that'll allow me to log on to the VPN for the corporation. It'll allow me to read my encrypted mail. It'll allow me to sign my mail, et cetera, et cetera. You can't always connect up via USB. Sometimes you're typing something into a web form. Sometimes you're accessing external application. If you press the button on this, and it's saying wait now, a new one-time password comes up every time the button is pressed. Now, one-time password tokens have been around for about 20 years. 20 years is significant here. 20 years is the length of time that a US patent lasts. And the idea of Oath, which is an initiative that VeriSign has been spearheading, um, is to have an open standard for authentication tokens. Uh, before Oath, these were $45 per user per year. And they were being used exclusively as an enterprise security device for a select number of enterprises. You turn it into a commodity standard. You make it non-proprietary. You allow any manufacturer to uh, ma make them. Unfortunately, these are in my slide are all branded with VeriSign, but Aladdin make them, GemPlus make them. All the card, almost all the card manufacturers you can imagine are making these tokens or are part of the Earth Initiative. So that's one thing. However, it's going to take us a little time to replace these things with these things. I mean, at some point in the future, I believe that you will have your credit card and there will be a little window and there's some electronic ink and you'll press it and a new number will come up each time. But it will take us an awful long time to change that infrastructure. And until then, it'll still be possible to steal credit card numbers and all sorts of other valuable information by impersonating a trusted party. So we have to close both loopholes. We have to make the credentials theft proof, but we've also got to stop people being able to pretend to be anybody who they choose on the internet. All right, it's all right to be anonymous. You know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So Bubbles is uh, happy there. But anonymity is not the same thing as impersonation. I have the right to be anonymous if I choose. I have the right to be pseudonymous. That is, I have an identity, but the online identity is different from my offline identity. What I do not have the right to do is to pretend to be Citibank or Bank of America or Microsoft or anybody else. I don't have the right to impersonate. So how can we establish a system that will allow us to authenticate ourselves securely? And this is a CAN demo. It doesn't actually have code behind it. I prefer not to have to write code behind it, but it demonstrates some of the features that I think could be put into security schemes 
and how simple and how usable we could make a security interface. So this is Vmail. And imagine that this is the first time I'm coming to, my, to this site. I'm going to come to Vmail, and that's going to be my portal to my existing POP3 or IMAP mail account out there in the Ethernet. So I'm going to type in, or rather Alice is going to type in her email address. Password. OK. Well, the first thing is, did you notice that we never told the uh, system the POP3 account or the outgoing mail server or the incoming mail server or all that half hour of configuration that uh, I get phone calls from my mother asking me, how do I configure my email to talk to FreeServe? I mean, I'm in a different country. I'm, in fact, I'm on a different continent, and I'm debugging somebody's email on the other continent. Turns out that uh, somebody had misdone the configurations. Well, the first thing is, there's this thing called the DNS, and this thing called this the SRV record. And the SRV record is there for advertising services. So if you have an SRV record in the DNS, it could advertise the names of your, the locations of your POP3 server, your IMAP server, and all the other configuration information that the user normally has to type in. And this is something that could have been done eight years ago, but it wasn't because, hey, we do protocols, we don't do usability. I'm not responsible for the usability of POPM3 and my map. What I'm responsible for is the security settings. We can pull up the security settings in exactly the same way. So lesson number one, never make the user configure anything. Don't ask them for anything more than a username, their account email and their password. That should be sufficient. So question number two, uh, we're going to get a message from a bank and we want to be sure that it's from that bank or from that trusted party. Okay, this is another not the demo page and this is because if I don't show you this one, I'm going to get questions on the next one. Email can include HTML and can include JavaScript, that is true. Just because email can include embedded images, JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't mean that you have to show it to the user. OK? Sounds fair enough? So with that in mind, now let's see how a user could receive a message from a trusted source and be sure that it came from that trusted source. So here we have, again, very similar webmail, a message. And it's talking about Zotop. OK, there's something bad on the internet. And this is a standard letter that I get out pretty much every day. And it's coming from security at idefense.com. That's not coincidentally a VeriSign company. The reason why I use VeriSign here is because if I use anybody else's brand, uh, we'll have problems with the filming. OK. Now we also have on the same day, we've got a second security alert. And this security alert is saying the first one's a hoax. How does the user know which one's the hoax and which is the real one? Well, we have fairly educated users. I mean, you're an, a security specialist before you get this. But how many people really are that alert to see that it's security at onedefense.com, not idefense? How many people are really that alert to notice, OK, there's some bad spelling? And even if it is bad spelling, I mean, like, there are people who can't spell it who work for banks and so on as well. So this is the traditional, pro you know, we've got this email and we just don't know whether it's genuine and whether it's false. OK, so the technology that we could use here called a digital signature. And we can sign the message and we could use SMIME and we could dis distribute it securely. The problem is, how does the user know from first glance that this message is genuine and not a spoof. 
And what we need to do is to have a user interface that is so transparent that people start to pick up the security user interface without having to read the manual on what the security user interface does. So what we've done in this one is that if you look in the top right-hand corner, we have the logo, iDefense. Okay? And the way that we've done this is if we click on this, it'll bring up a little panel that'll tell us something about it. So what happened here was that this message was signed digitally using the domain keys identified mail email signature standard, or sorry, specification. DKIM is a signature specification that I believe Gmail has been applying to its outgoing mail for some time, uh, originally developed by Yahoo and Cisco and VeriSign, Microsoft's uh, SendMail, PGP. Pretty much everybody in the security world is part of that um, effort and is backing this specification. What we've done here is that we've added, we've taken the domain key spec and we've extended it so that you take the domain key signature from the DNS and you can verify the signature. And then that rec the record that gives you the key in the DNS also gives you some information to say, hey, I got a digital certificate and I've proved that I really am who I say I am to a certification authority. In this case, VeriSign, but there are other very uh, authentic certification authorities in existence in a competitive market, you know, free market rules. And that certificate also makes use of an extension to the X509 specification that is an ITF standard called the logo type extension, and that contains the iDefense icon. So the upshot is that when I get the signed DKIM mail message, the client can show me that icon in such a way that I can be sure it really is from iDefense. And if it comes from, an, if a mail came from somebody else with the icons in it, the icon could not appear in the Chrome. It could not appear in that security bar. It would appear in the body of the message. So you've still got some ability to do some user confusion. However, we now have a very tight way of saying, if you see that message there, for the first time, we can say, you can actually rely upon this message coming from who it says it is. And at the moment, we did not got that in email, which is really quite amazing. I mean, like, public key cryptography has been around for a quarter of a decade. There have been four different ITF working groups that have reported back who have been developing security for email. We're just starting a fifth one. But this would be the first time that we'd be able to uh, know with confidence that this mail really did come from who it said it. So one issue with like a trusted logo scheme like this is just that somebody has to verify the logo, right? So the signing authority now has to check logos and make sure that your logo really is your logo and it doesn't isn't designed to resemble the eye defense logo. Absolutely. And you better want make sure that it's a competent person doing that authentication, not rent a CA. You know, you don't want Fred the Builder just issuing those. Okay, there's two lines of defense here. If we go back to the uh, security pane, uh, I was going to come to that in the slides, but I'll do it now. You notice that there's two logos. There's a logo of iDefense and there's a logo of the CA. Okay, so the idea here is you know that you've got somebody to hold responsible if something goes wrong. Either you can hold iDefense accountable, or if it turns out not to be iDefense, you can hold the CA accountable. Okay? Now, you could imagine that there would be some CAs in the world who would be less than 100% reliable, who might allow extremely big bank corp to come along, get a certificate, without really doing much checking at all. However, in this new world, your own, low, your own reputation, your own identity as a CA is going to be online as well. And so if you do that, you've got a self, if, if you, you've got an accountability scheme. If you default, if you make an error, you're going to be held accountable because people are going to stop trusting your logo 
as soon as you can say slash dot. You know, the first person who puts out a bogus certificate with a logo in here is going to make the headlines on news.com slash dot if they're lucky. More likely, they'll make front page of the Wall Street Journal. So you've got accountability. You've got consequences for everybody, not just for the holder of the certificate. So one other question I have, and I'm not sure, maybe I should just let you go complete your slides, but an attacker could just spoof the entire flow because my defense's logo isn't a secret. So if I could get you to enter your password into my site, and then I create a uh, spoof of this entire page, uh, the user, 60-year-old grandmother, is going to know well, yeah, it wouldn't work so much better if uh, this was uh, put into uh, Gmail. Yeah, I have to start from some trusted base, OK? I cannot work from nothing. I have to have somewhere I trust in order to build. You know, I need a rock to build my... Yeah, and, and this actually is one of the things, you know, I tried to argue against so much flexibility in the user interface uh, a while back and <laughs> didn't win that argument. You know, people were saying, hey, people want the ability to pixel place their GIFs. And I was saying, well, yeah, people would also like to be secure and, ah, oh, no. <laughs> yes, you've got to have some regimentation. I mean, like, the security of this scheme depends upon the Chrome that gray bar coming across, you have to make sure that nothing else can get the images into that Chrome. I have to have some part of the user interface that is trusted in order to bootstrap the whole system. And we have to get to a point where we're developing user interfaces that communicate, this is the trustworthy part, and this is the part where anybody can party. And this is actually the subject of a workshop uh, that's going to be held by W3C that's coming up, I believe it's uh, April. There's a call for papers out there for that that closes tomorrow. So... One other point is that basically, like today, like to your point, but the most, the, the user interface where you see most of the problems is the web interface, right? So you can extend this concept of a secure internet load that you have, even to the web, uh, even just to the browser. Uh, yes. That's the other point, yes. The, for this to work, it's got to be ubiquitous. If I go into a bank, the bank has the logo of the bank on it. The ATM in the uh, foyer has the logo of the bank. The statement has the logo of the bank. The, you know, every piece of paper I get from the mail has the logo on the bank. The idea of secure letterhead is every email, every website, every instant message communication, every SIP communication, every voice over IP communication, every protocol that we haven't thought about yet. So by building upon these existing standards, we can hook this, that trust into any system you choose. Okay. But yeah, the, the question is, how do we get this rolling? There are two areas that are really good for getting the ball started. Area number one is websites. There are 400,000 VeriSign issued SSL certificates already out there. Adding, doing the additional authentication and then adding a logo in there is not a complicated task. And it's one that when I talk to, you know, <coughs> every single person I've talked to has a, a famous 50 brand is uh, on board the minute that I talk about this. So I'd love to see Firefox, I'd love to see Internet Explorer have the ability to use that top right hand corner, you know the point where that has that silly icon? I'd like that icon to be what it was originally intended for by Dave Raggett. You know, do you remember that 13 years ago? Dave Raggett showed this, more or less this exact scheme. I'd like that to be the logo that says, yes, this is really Bank of America, or this is really Citibank, or this is really, you know, whoever needs to establish themselves in a trustworthy way. So, Uh, 
Uh, they would. Well, actually, we should we should uh, remove the uh, brand. The trusted bank, trustedbank.com, is going to have to be authenticated by a certification authority, and that certification authority is going to need to meet a certain bar of trustworthiness, and that's another part of this problem uh, that is partly underway. And I showed you the feedback system. The other thing will be uh, high assurance criteria. There's an organization called Web Trust that you have to get audited by to uh, become a CA. The problem with Web Trust is that the criteria for becoming Web Trust auth audited is, are not very high. You say what authentication you're going to do, and they check that you do it. You don't have to say that you do very much. And that's why there are now certificates around there where the only thing that's been ch checked is the domain name. Now, Domain name only certification is perfectly viable. We do it ourselves on the Thought brand. We don't do it on the VeriSign brand, but we do have a label where we, that we use for domain only certs. It prevents DNS attacks. It provides you with proof that it really is the other party's public key. So there is value there. However, if I'm going to hand over my credit card number, if I'm going to interact with the, this person thinking that they really are who they say they are, I want to have more authentication. I want to be sure that it really is that bank, that owner of that logo. And there are ways that you can check for that. For example, uh, registries of trademarks. If, if somebody's using a logo to represent themselves, they should at least have a trademark application in on it. Now, you could have a fraudulent application. However, if we've got an address where a legal process can be served, and the crooks give it to us, well, we'll send the FBI around or the Secret Service or whatever, and we'll deal with them that way. So yes, it's a very important question. Uh, I believe it is soluble, but I don't want to get into the 10-year uh, history of CA services. OK. Actually, this is my last slide. Uh, this demo actually also has as well as having the email signatures, it also has uh, transparent encryption built in. So you can receive encrypted messages and send encrypted messages without the uh, pain that uh, certain user clients put you through. So I just, just wanted to mention that. So who guards the guardians? We've discussed this before. It's not just about making the party you talk to accountable, the trust providers must also hold themselves accountable. I think that that's what's wrong currently in the SSL world. And that's it.